What's up everybody? We found a better way to keep and breed dubias. So I want to show you how we set up these tubs. Selling in the billions each year, Rainbow Mealworms is your one-stop shop for all your insect needs. Their quality feeders and A-plus customer service keep me coming back to support the health and growth of all of our animals. Visit them today at rainbowmealworms.net to place your order. Now these are the current tubs we're using. These are 18 gallon tubs from Walmart. They only cost $5 each and they've done well up until this point. But the problem is it just doesn't hold that many egg crates. It doesn't maximize the space that is contained in this container. And when you're running a business, it's all about maximizing your potential. We refer to that as efficiency. What is the most output that I could get out of the least input? And that is efficiency. So one of the issues with these tubs that you see behind me right now, there's a lot of dead space, a lot of empty space that does not get utilized for the roaches. And therefore, it's a waste of money and it's a waste of space. We've been turned on recently to this new tub system that is going to increase the efficiency of our Dubia Roach operation tenfold. The first thing you're gonna need is to go to Home Depot because they carry the exact size tub that is going to maximize your potential. It's a 27 gallon tub. It's called an HDX Tough Tote. It is 28.6 inches wide, 19.6 inches long, and 15 inches high. This is what the tub looks like, and it is the perfect size tub for your standard Dubia Roach operation, which is using egg crates. And I will show you exactly why later on. You're also going to need a hole saw drill bit. The hole saw drill bit is called this thing. It's this circular device that allows you to drill a hole for ventilation. The brand that I see at Home Depot represented the most is Milwaukee, and you can buy the hole saw in almost any size. Half inch, one inch, two inch, three inch. This is a three inch bit. You can buy the three inch circular part along with what they call the arbor. This black thing is called the arbor. It connects into your drill. So this is a perfect example of how the arbor will connect the hole saw to your drill. Now, whenever you're drilling, especially into plastic, it's a good idea to have a piece of wood on the other side that is flush against the plastic surface that you're drilling into. This will minimize vibrations, it will minimize cracks and tears in the plastic along the way. And perfect, you can see a perfect size hole drilled right there. And now we're gonna repeat this process with all four sides of the tote. Okay, now here is something to be aware of with the hole saw that I didn't know. You're going to get pieces of plastic stuck in here. So all you need to do is just go in and poke it out with a screwdriver or in this case a pencil. That way it won't clog your drill bit as you continue to drill through all the other tubs. So here's a little trick I'm learning right now with the drill bit is if you hit something that is too strong for this drill bit to go through initially, sometimes it kind of back torques and then winds up loosening the bit. And then you have to take this off and retighten it and it winds up taking time. So the little trick that I've learned right now is you go forward, so you go normal clockwise. And if you hit that position where it starts to feel like it's stopping, put it in reverse and spin it in reverse for a little bit and then put it back into forward and spin it forward and then do that back and forth a couple times and the bit won't come out if you do it perfectly with, with good timing. So with practice, it's gonna save you time in the long run. So we're going forward right now. Kinda hit a stopping point right here. Go backwards. It's clear. Forward again. Stopping point, backwards, and forwards. And now we're through. And the drill bit never came off. I never had to undo it and retighten it. 
saves a lot of time. If you don't put so much force on the drill bit into the plastic, the drill bit will have more time to heat up and drill through the plastic cleanly the first time so you're not having to go forwards and backwards with the drill bit. So instead of putting a lot of force downwards into the plastic, what I'm gonna do right now is just allow it to spin freely and heat up and kind of melt its way through the plastic. Watch. And then towards the very end, you'll want to pull up on the plastic just a little bit because that will put a little bit of upwards tension, allowing the drill bit just to cut through that last bit. Okay, now this is a perfect example of how you learn as you go. The ultimate fastest way I've discovered so far is a combination of the first two methods. Applying pressure with the drill and slight upwards pressure pulling the plastic toward the drill bit. A little bit downwards force and upwards, pulling upwards with your hand. Now because I'm OCD and super sensitive about the cleanliness and the organization of all of our stuff, I'm going to wash off all the little bits of plastic that stuck to the totes as I was drilling through. Okay, now this thing is almost your best friend as a reptile breeder. It's so good for so many different things. But today, we are going to use it for adhering the screen mesh to the plastic. This can also be purchased from Home Depot. It's the Aero brand. It's not super expensive. I think it's 20, 30 bucks. And then you could buy these Aero glue sticks as well. So this is a hot glue gun and it's gonna be used to secure the mesh to the plastic holes. Now this is some leftover mesh we have. It's actually called pet mesh when you go to Home Depot or Walmart. So it's a little bit thicker than your traditional mosquito screen door mesh, but make sure you don't get the aluminum mesh. I've made that mistake before and the aluminum mesh is really, really sharp and pointy and it could actually poke your animal's eyes out. It's gonna get underneath your nails and poke you. It's just not a fun experience. This is actually a soft material. It doesn't say the name of the material on this packaging. It's just called pet resistant. And underneath here, it's labeled charcoal anthracite. It's just labeled charcoal. And then these are other languages under here. Anyway, the key is being soft and not pokey and metal. Now it's always easier to adhere mesh to the front rather than the inside because the inside you're gonna be in weird angles trying to you know get the hot glue on there. So the first thing we wanna do is cut out as many screen holes as we're gonna need. We have six tubs, there's four holes per tub, so we're gonna need 24 pieces of screen. So I'm going to cut a piece of screen that is as thick as we're gonna need it. You just line it up over the hole, cut it a little bit wider than the hole, and then now cut it even. All right, so we wanna cut one example of how thick we need it, which is about that thick. You want a little bit of overhang on each side of the circle, because that's where the hot glue is going to adhere to. And now that we know the size we need, we're just gonna hold it up to the rest of the strip, and we are going to cut all of the pieces. Okay, now we're averaging six pieces per strip here. Each of these strips are four feet. So I'm just going to line up the rest of the three strips since we cut one and make all three cuts at the same time. And we have our mock-up piece here. And then I could just kind of eyeball the size that's needed. It would be best if you do it on a flat table so that this isn't sliding. And yep, that'll work. So now we should have all 24 pieces we need here. Now with the hot glue gun, you'll always want another piece as backup that will continue to push the glue forward and melt it. Now there is a technique that I've learned with the hot gluing that makes things easy and very secure. So you put your little mesh over the area and then you start hot gluing around the, the circle, the edge that you want, and press at the same time. As you're pressing, that will secure the hot glue to the mesh and also the mesh to the plastic. So it's kind of like coloring in a picture with a marker. And you can also hear the force of the hot glue gun pressing the glue through. Now off to the side, you'll want a place to rest the hot glue gun. 
because it's going to leak. You can see it's leaking right now. You need something for it to drip on that's okay. And the hot glue gun has a little kickstand. I never use that kickstand, I just lay it sideways like that, you can see. Now this glue does not take very long to dry, a couple seconds, and then you'll wanna test it. You'll push lightly with your finger and make sure that none of the glue areas come up to make sure it's completely secure and this one is. Now you can glue everything like this, like flip it and then do all the testing at the end. That way you're not sitting there for like 30 seconds each hole waiting for it to dry before moving on. And again, you're maximizing your output for as least amount of input as possible. Efficiency. That's what the business world is all about. And also the mass keeping reptile world. When you're keeping hundreds of animals, time is so much of the essence. So I'll check this hole last since it's freshest, but I'll go around now and do a quick finger check. See, I'm pushing lightly with my finger, making sure that there are no exposed holes. Perfect guys, this one is done. All right, so now we're just gonna repeat the process with all six of these. Now here's another quick pro tip about the hot glue gun that I've learned. Make sure it's super, super hot before starting your job, whatever it might be. Because if it's not, when you first start gluing stuff, it's not gonna stick that great. It's gonna be frustrating and it's gonna take you a long time to adhere that mesh to the surface. But if it's super, super hot, the glue is so well melted that it just pushes right through the screen onto the plastic and sticks within a millisecond. Now another tip about the hot glue gun, there's a trigger that pushes the first glue stick further and further down the gun, but there's nothing that pushes whatever glue stick is behind. So every couple seconds or so, or every minute, you wanna take this glue stick and push it forward to make sure that it's touching the other glue stick and that will make sure that it gets melted the quickest once it makes it into the hot chamber here. I wanna just give you guys a quick close up of what the glue is looking like. So you can see when I press the hot glue gun onto the mesh, it creates sort of like a river, like a divot. That's good because that means that all the glue now is pushed through the mesh and is touching the mesh and the plastic, adhering exactly what you need. So you can see from a sideways perspective, the glue does not bubble up that much above the surface. It's all pressed flat as much as possible. And you could use another item to do it. You could use like a pair of scissors or anything that's metal to push on that. But since the tip of the hot glue gun is already metal, you might as well use the tip of the hot glue gun to push on your surface. All right guys, we got all the hot gluing done and we are ready to start making the transfers. So we're going to take all the roaches from these tubs and we're going to transfer them into each one of these tubs, except these tubs are gonna house two times the amount of roaches as these tubs. So we'll be able to take two of these tubs and put it in one bin and that'll be fine. Okay, now I wanna explain what's going on in here real quick and why this is not an optimal use of space. So in this crate, we have about maybe 600 adult females and they're kind of crammed into this one corner right here, which is not that good. Roaches like community, they like to be together, but not overcrowded. And although I could pile up a couple extra crates right here, it's not going to be nearly as much space as I can give them pound for pound, inch for inch in here. So I'm gonna show you. Right now we could fit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe eight, nine, maybe 10. 10 crates total in here. Let me show you what we could fit in here. Now I would normally use brand new crates every time I sift to put in here, but because I already have pretty good crates in the last tote, I don't wanna waste those crates. So we're gonna take this crate here and put it just like that. Then you have your cardboard divider. This doesn't have to be the same size as the egg crate, but it helps to be as close to the size of the egg crate as possible to reduce movement. And then once the crates kind of get leaning, you can kind of push the bottom a little bit to give you space for one more egg crate. And that's the problem when you have roaches already in here, is that now you're kind of squishing them a little, but just kind of wiggle it back and forth, give them a chance to move out of the pressure zones. Now when this last piece goes in, it's gonna be a little bit tight. So you could pull up the spacer a little bit like this, kind of wiggle it down in place. You could also pull up and jiggle 
a little bit the other egg crates that will allow for everything to sit tightly in place. So now you can see we took all of the space that was in that one bin and we converted it over to this bin. And so literally only half of this bin is holding the exact amount of roaches that this bin was. It doesn't matter which way the crate is facing because the spacer is gonna help keep each crate the same distance from each other. We got room for one more spacer. And if it gets a little tight, you could pull up the spacer a little and just kind of just kind of shimmy things around a little bit. Kind of pull up a couple of the other crates and that relieves a little bit of tension and bam, everything falls in place. Now look at that. This one tub, which is nearly the same size as the 18 gallon. I mean, it's not that big of a difference. This is 27 gallon, this is 18 gallon, the blue one. But look at the amount of roaches difference that you can fit. So you could fit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven crates with spacers. And then you could actually fit two crates on top, which will allow for you to put the food up there so the food doesn't have to fall to the bottom every time, creating more mess for you during cleanup and sifting months. Okay, now you might ask, what's the magical number for what can fit in these totes that we're using? If I'm taking about 600 females for every blue tote and then putting it into this tote, that's about 1,000 to 1,200 females that we're putting in the tote. And for that, at a one to five male ratio, we're putting in about two to 300 males for that 1,000 to 1,200 females. And that's what we're experimenting with right now. If we see low productivity numbers again, we might need to lessen the amount of females per square footage or lessen the amount of males. There's a bunch of different factors you can play around with, but in general, I'm pretty hopeful for the way we are setting the tubs right now. Now, as with any business, there is some experimentation at play. So we are actually gonna set up one of the larger bins with half the amount of roaches that we set up the other bins in just to see if those females are more productive or not. If they're more productive, that tells us to be really careful about overcrowding and that helps us narrow down that exact scientific number that the roaches prefer for max productivity. So here's some bonus footage on how to reset the vegetables and water every three to four days. So you'll take the one egg crate, which is on top of one side, kind of shimmy it a little, make sure you don't crush any roaches. Take your little pump spray and you'll spray in between every egg crate, but you don't need to spray the side walls yet. We will get those side walls later. So just a few seconds in between every egg crate. What this will do is allow for the water to soak into the egg crates which will provide not only a drinking source for the roaches, which is great for their health and reproduction, but it will also provide humidity, which is great for their health and reproduction. So there you go, in between every egg crate, they're gonna come to the surface. So you kinda wanna put this down gently, kinda shimmy it a little bit, make sure no one gets trapped, cause this is pretty heavy. And you'll do the same thing to this side. In between every egg crate, any of the vegetables that are kinda done, you can throw away, but all of these still have a little bit left, so. I don't need to throw them away just yet. What I'll do is I'll start with my celery and it actually fits perfectly. You just start dropping it into slots like that. And you know, for these size tubs, you could just put maybe six or seven of them that can just string across the whole thing. And then you'll wanna fill in the rest of the space with carrots. Try as much as possible to just find divots in places that the vegetables can fit so that you don't have to drop it down low in there and then have to worry about it molding if you can't see it. And if the carrots are too high it's going to press against the roof and then kind of push the crates down a little bit which is not that big of a deal but for my OCD-ness that worries all the time about roach safety and keeping them alive it's just something I want to avoid and you could also break the carrots in half to snugly fit them wherever they fit you could put them sideways you just find little places to put them ideally if you could keep everything going vertical I think that's the most streamlined and the most appeasing for organization freaks or OCD people. Now we will spray all the reservoirs on the sides because this will allow for all the water to drip down and gather more along the bottom and therefore create a better drinking source for the roaches. And that's very important for roach health and productivity. And the last thing you'll just kind of spray over the vegetables a little bit because they're gonna be going for the vegetables and therefore they will find their water top of the vegetables. And bam, this tub is reset now for three or four more days. Okay, one more thing you might wanna do, you have four holes, one on each side of the tub. You can spray a little bit of water 
every night or every no other night into the tub. This will promote for more humidity, more accessibility to fresh water, and that should account for better roach health and breeding productivity for your colonies. And you can see the roaches going for all the vegetables already. Really great, you got some going for the celery, some going for the carrots. Both celery and carrots make a great roach chow because it contains a lot of moisture and that helps them with breeding and productivity. Well, that is it for this episode, guys. Let me know what you thought. Do you have any questions that I did not cover? Put it in the comments below. I'll be sure to get back to you. Also, feel free to reach out to me personally, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, website or email at geekygeckocreations.com. So I thank you guys so much. I will see you guys in the next video. Make sure you leave a comment below of video topics that you would like for us to cover. Mwah. Love you guys and have a Geeky Gecko great day.